Okay, uh, thank y'all for having us. Um, we're very excited and we're even more excited to be after the, um, the command module. So we're gonna tell y'all about the restoration of Apollo Mission Control Center. The cathedral is a word that came up repeatedly from the flight controllers that were interviewing. Uh, Mr. Kranz called it the cathedral. Um, just, just basically, you know, in our mind, it doesn't look like a cathedral in any kind of way or resemble it architecturally, but uh, just the importance, that's just illustrating the importance level that they put on this place uh, going to work there every day and then, and then looking back at uh, what it really meant to them. So that's, that's why we titled this, it's, it's, it's their cathedral. Uh, just kind of give some background on the location that we're talking about, uh, the Mission Control Building, the Christopher C. Kraft Jr. Mission Control Center, Building 30 at Johnson Space Center. Uh, it is an NHL, as Mr. Olson talked about yesterday. Um, where we specifically restored is the, uh, known as the Apollo Mission Control Center. It's the third floor of the Chris Kraft Mission Control Center. Um, we restored the mission we're control. Old fashioned. Yep, okay. can do. Okay, so just pass it between you. Okay. <laughs> I was hoping we'd get to do this because then I can just, you know, yeah. get some wraps going. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we re looked at res we restored the Michigan operations control room, known as the Moker, uh, visitors viewing room, summary display room, uh, which is behind the screens, known as the Bat Cave. Um, the simulation control room, which is adjacent to the mission operations control room uh, where they simulated the flights. Um, and then the ro recovery operations control room, known as the Roker. Uh, that, that space wasn't available for us to restore, but we did do a little something, which we'll get into here. Uh, just to show you what that it looks like laid out here. The third floor, uh, we're shaded blue there. That's kind of the primary focus of the restoration on the third floor. <clears throat> there were support rooms surrounding those, those rooms that were not restored and have in modern times here been used for different purposes now. But you can see the, the mission operations control room, the visitors viewing area at the top, um, the bat cave where all the, the action happened behind the scenes and the uh, recovery, the roker and the simulation control room. So. That's how it looks. Um, this is Building 30, the Mission Control Center in the 1960s. I believe this is the south elevation. Mm -hmm. um, it's changed since. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and just a little bit of history of the room itself. Uh, it was used in 1965. Uh, uh, several Jiminy missions were flown out of the room. Um, Apollo 4 was the first Apollo mission flown out of the room. Of, of the Moker II, as it was known. In the 70s, there were major renovations uh, for shuttle, and it, the name changed to Ficker II, Flight Control Room II in 1976. Um, and then in 1985, Building 30 was designated an NHL um, for the Man in Space theme study. 1992, that was the last shuttle mission that was flown out of the room, and then 95, uh, Ficker 2 was deactivated and open to tours. Um, and it's at this time that things begin to kind of head south for the room. We can pass oh, it to okay, you. Yeah. Yeah. So in 2013, uh, the, in 1992 when the room was left, um, when they moved to the new uh, shuttle mission control center, <clears throat> the white Ficker in building 30 south, the room was left vacant and the Texas SHPO said, you, you have to, as mitigation, you have to restore that room so for Building 30 South. So <clears throat> JSC went and they set about a plan to try to restore it and that never happened. So it sort of sat there for a long time. And what happened is that anyone could get into the building, could get on, you could sit at the console, sit in the seats, press the buttons and so forth. So it really began to degrade. And in 2013, I asked the Park Service of the Heritage Partnership Program for a $5,000 grant for a, some sort of little video that we could show in the room so that people would have a sense of what, what the room was. And so the original director came down with the Parks um, Heritage Partnership uh, lady and she, they saw it in the state it was and they said, we will give you $20,000 grant to match for a historic furnishing survey. And so because of the Park Service, that's where that began. 
And that is what started the restoration. <clears throat> that entire uh, analysis of the room, of what it would take to bring it back into its uh, Apollo status is what really helped. And once they saw it, they, they knew that the significance of the room. And so that's kind of where we started. Uh, in 2014, we did hold a, a workshop that all the stakeholders kind of came in and um, assessed what was going to happen. And that is where we got the first buy-in from the flight controllers, uh, especially Ed Vendell and, and Gene Kranz. They really were 100% behind it. Okay. Um, so this is the, it wasn't an easy process because after the workshop, um, the, the center did not have budget to do it. They really weren't interested in doing it. And then there was a big tussle between who would actually do it. Would it be flight operations who ran the room? Would it be external relations who are our public affairs office? Would it be our visitor center, Space Center Houston? Would it be us who are the rest, uh, preservationists? And so there was a big, huge fight. And so you can see through the, it, from 2013, nothing really happened. It was just a big battle from one year to the next. And we, uh, finally, the Park Service stepped in and made it a threatened National Historic Landmark in 2015. So this continued, um, we, the Park Service even came down and met with the Center Operations Director. Nothing really happened. Um, Mr. Kranz finally went to the Houston Chronicle and then wrote what we call his nuclear letter, which went to the NASA Administrator, it went to um, the Park Service, the ACHP, our Congressman, the National Park Service, and that kind of began to, to push JSC to get the restoration. So a new team was formed and that, that kind of had begun the historic restoration part. All along, we had kind of been working on what it would take to, to get the historic furnishings report. So finally, um, the city of Webster donated $3.5 million, and then that's what was able to get us really kicked off and going. You want to talk about okay. the consultation meeting? Oh, yes. We did have the consultation meeting in April 2017, and Chris Daniels came. Thank you very much. And then our federal preservation officer, Rebecca Klein's here, she was there. And that was very um, influential as well because we were able to really push to get it historically accurate because there was a lot of push to make it very um, experiential. You know, what would the, the millennials want to see? What would children want to see? How do you tell this story? And so we pushed and pushed to make sure that it was historically accurate. And then we, we actually did win that battle. So this is just um, more of the same, the, the time frame. Finally, in 2017, now remember the 50th anniversary for the moon landing was in 2019. So in 2017, we started a research and groundwork because we had not done a forensic survey of the room at all. So we really didn't, we knew what needed to be done, but we didn't know how and, and to what extent it needed to be done. So finally, we got that plan together. We got a, um, the budget that we, we had determined what that was, and we actually started the restoration work in January of 2018, and we're, we were substantially complete by the time the anniversary rolled around. Okay. Okay, that's you. Okay. All right, uh, before I get into the period of significance, um, just kind of mention, during the funding, once Webster raised the money and it was in Space Center Houston's control, and pocketbook, you know, how does it get to the <clears throat> federal government? Um, well, in the, the 1976, the amendments to the NHPA, as well as an executive order in 2003 uh, by President Bush, uh, those things put together uh, created a situation where a nonprofit organization, Space Center Houston, could donate that money to the ACHP, and the ACHP could then distribute that to the, to the government for NASA to, NASA to uh, for historic preservation purposes. So, and actually, that's the first time that process was ever used. Um, the period of significance. Um, this is this is pretty <coughs> plain and simple, I think, for mission control. You know, obviously, a lot happened in the room. We lost Challenger in that room, uh, as I mentioned before. Jiminy was in that room. Uh, lots of flights uh, flew out of that room, but in the whole scope of things, um, and we want to talk about you know, human history, you know, we, we learned how to manipulate, create and manipulate fire. We created the wheel. Uh, we, we learned how to do, domesticate plants and animals. 
And we also figured out how to put men on the moon and bring them back safely. I mean, these are you know, huge human advances. So that first time that we accomplished that obviously is, is stuck in our, in our memories and you know, to us and the historic furnishings report, um, folks that got together and talked about this, this is, this is kind of a, a no brainer. We did preserve obviously some of the things that happened in that room over time, but this was the real focus was Apollo 11 first lunar landing. Um, so Ed Ventel was really critical in uh, the very beginnings and, and throughout the project actually uh, in getting this thing kicked off and, and everyone understanding why this is so important to not just the flight controllers but to humanity really. And his vision was, uh, you know, from way back, um, Apollo mission control should be restored to a degree of accuracy that will feel to visitors like the day we walked out. And I feel like that we accomplished that. I think if we're able to get to the 80-something slide that we have, uh, you'll see that also. <laughs> <laughs> so I apologize we're going fast. Tell who that is. That's Gene Kranz. That, that's Mr. Kranz. Gene Kranz is standing there and Ed Findell sitting there smiling, yeah. kind of how they interact still today. Mm -hmm. Um, this is just, uh, you know, kind of the vision, right? Apollo 11, July 1969, a lot of men working in there, flight documents, a lot going on, things lit up, a very active, very live room. Um, that, that was kind of the, the vision that Mr. Fendel and, and others had had for this room. Um, also the viewing room, which if you go today, it's, you're, you're sitting in the historic chairs that existed at the time, a uh, very VIP room, um, movie theater seating, uh, just a really great, comfortable space to, to see the activities below. Uh, the communications booth just above Mission Operations Control Room also restored. And, and you know, if you go today, you'll, you'll minus the humans sitting there, it, it looks exactly the same. Uh, the simulation control room really didn't have a lot of documentation of what this room looked like for, you know, during the Apollo 11 moon landing. Um, this, this photograph is actually Jiminy. Um, so we did, we really did our best, you know, we didn't, we didn't in any situation throughout the restoration assume something, you know, if it, if we couldn't find the information, it, we just didn't put it back. So today you'll go in this room, there's not really flight documents and things like that in this room, we just didn't have the evidence to, to demonstrate what it should look like. But we did know the configuration of the console, so those are put back in place. Uh, and then the recovery operations control room. Again, we didn't have access to this room, so we, we um, created an image on the window of what that space looked like, and this, this is that image on that window now. So actually, there's a neat story about Mr. Kranz was in there um, doing a news interview, and he's kind of walking along doing the interview, and as he gets to the end of the aisle, he looks and, and sees this picture you know, in the window, and for a second, he, he thinks it's real. He's, you know, back in time and, and you know, whoa, wait. I, he kind of does a little double take and, and believes he's looking back into the recovery operations control room. It was, it was pretty neat. So I think we did a, a good job there. So the pre-restoration conditions. This room, um, as Sandra mentioned, was it 95? That was 92. 92 that was um, opened up for tours and uh, the doors were wide open pretty much at all times. Uh, employees could come through, visitors come through, Space Center Houston had tours through there. Um, and it, it really wasn't taken care of, maintained. You can see the stains on the carpet, tape on the carpet to hold it down. Um, there was vandalism, you know, visitors and employees alike would steal buttons, things like that off of here. That, that continues today in other buildings. It's, it's kind of sad that things go missing. Uh, there was curtains over the simulation control room, which historically weren't there. Obviously, the simulation control guys needed to evil eye the, the gentleman they were trying to trick through their simulations. Um, and then, you know, as I mentioned, the, the, the medallions, the shuttle, there, lots of flights flew out of this room, so there were a lot more medallions on the walls than, than what there were during Apollo 11, obviously. You can see here missing buttons, broken buttons, things kind of rusting, paint chips. The condition of some of the wallpaper. Uh, the middle photo is um, the standing desk in the back of the viewing room. Pieces of that were oftentimes cut off and, and taken away by visitors. 
Uh, then the, you know, just the general humid, humid conditions in the room causing a lot of rust in the vents and on the consoles. <coughs> Uh, the viewing room chairs, uh, most of the, the lids of the ashtrays that are on the back of the chairs uh, were missing. Thank you. I have a green pointer. <laughs> um, some of the chairs were ripped. Uh, the springs and bolts and things of that weren't functioning correctly. So it was, it was uh, you know, still comfortable, but a pretty raggedy situation when you put the seat down to sit in it. Um, Space Center Houston had put some photographs in the back of the room just to try to, you know, add, add to the room, not necessarily. Uh, again, tape on the, on, the, on the carpet, stains, missing paint, graffiti on the door. On the door. Um, this is a, a photo, of this is how it used to be visited. You could just go in, sit in the chairs, um, poke things, take, you know, <laughs> do, poke the buttons, sit on the consoles there's there's so many photographs you can find online of you know a, a rock group getting their picture taken and half of them are leaning or sitting on the consoles and you know it's it, it was just kind of overused um, so during the groundwork and research phase of this the very first thing we wanted to do was was talk to the former flight controllers uh, get get their feel of, of what the room looked like, what the lighting levels were, what buttons they interacted with the most. Um, you know, so we knew what we needed to light up and how this needed to be. And then, you know, obviously other, other stories that they had to tell, which are plentiful. This is Bill Moon on the left. Uh, on the right, I cannot remember that gentleman's name. I'd have to look at some notes. So we finally got to get started in January of 2018, um, finally. And you know, the, the 50 year anniversary was looming big time at that point. So we're getting a little nervous, but we got things started. So the very first thing we needed to do um, was get the consoles out and get them to Kansas Cosmosphere um, to get those restored so that we could begin working on the rest of the room. Um, and I, just kind of a note on the team, um, you know, I was, I was tasked with trying to figure out who could, who could do this type of restoration. Um, I knew that we were dealing with carpets and wallpapers and ceilings and, and wood and things like that, but we also had the very technological component of it, right? Um, so who, who can do that type of work? So, you know, I knew, you know, being in Texas, it has a really great um, courthouse preservation program that was implemented in, uh, what about 2003, I want to say? Uh, no, earlier than that. Um, but j at the time, Governor Bush put that into place and the Texas Historic Commission um, used that for courthouses all over Texas. I think Waxahachie actually was the, the first one that they did that for. So, <clears throat> but, uh, so I, I knew that that program exists and there's a lot of people throughout Texas that did this type of preservation work and call, you know, talk to the historic societies in Dallas and Fort Worth and San Antonio and Austin and Houston, and finally settled with Stern and Ducek as the, the architects that, that would do uh, the bulk of the work as far as restoring wallpapers, carpets, things like that. Um, and then for the consoles, that was a little more difficult. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and so I, I woke up one day and had this idea, well, maybe since Apollo 13 movie had completely recreated uh, the mission control room. If I was able to contact the art production designer, uh, then maybe I could get somewhere with restoring these consoles correctly. And sure enough, I was able to do that, found, found the gentleman that, that was in charge of that, and he directed me to the Kansas Cosmosphere who did that for the Apollo 13 movie. So they get busy right away and take them up to Kansas for work. Uh, we removed all the wall artifacts, um, this is the Apollo 13 Aquarius mirror. Uh, that's the Apollo 17 flag that was on the wall. So just taking all, just breaking this whole room down so we could build it back up to what it needed to be. Uh, obviously leaving the, the uh, historical materials in place that we could and, and that, were, that were relevant for the time period. So we removed ceilings, uh, re-leveled the floor, Put all, we, we actually put tape on all the tiles to make sure they went right back to exactly how we pulled them out. All the cigarettes. 
All the cigarettes, yes. Yeah, after removing some of the consoles, especially in the simulation control room, there were some crusty old cigarette butts underneath there still, so we scraped them off the floor and, and made sure to put those in a bag and, and so that we could put them back later in, in some of the um, in some of the ashtrays. All right. Okay. So these are some more of the, the details. Um, we found a ceiling tile in one of the original phone booths of down in the lobby. And so it's the one, it's, let's see, it's the one on your left. And so uh, we knew it was original. We had it uh, examined. And what they did is they did a computer, uh, what did they do? Cool, great. So they did a computer generation of the whole pattern and found an Armstrong tile that matched. It was just plain. And then they projected the whole pattern on these tiles and then they stamped them with holes that go in it. So this is what we did for the whole pattern to make sure the whole pattern matched the original. And we stamped over 200 uh, ceiling tiles for doing this. It took the guy three days to do it. Then we, uh, this is an original smoke detector we got out of building 37 and we put it up along with the new smoke detectors, but this is one of the old ones. Then this is uh, showing that the new ceiling was in. This room was also taken off of mission power. So every light uh, and every bit of electricity was taken, removed from mission power and put on general building power. And that took uh, almost a month to do that. Everything had to be rewired. And we also put in LED lighting so it wouldn't bleach any of the, um, the colors. And also it's, been on, it's on a system now that it, it goes up and down according to the visitor experience. Okay, this is, um, for some reason, we, we did not know, uh, we knew that they had recarpeted and re-wallpapered be between the Apollo program and the shuttle program, but we didn't have any information on the, the wallpaper. And one day, for some reason, somebody removed a fire extinguisher off the wall, and we found the original uh, wallpaper behind that. So we were able to take that off, and we went back to the original building drawings and found the manufacturer of the wallpaper we went to that company and they'd been purchased by another company who went into their warehouse and found the roller and then they were able to re-roll all of the wallpaper. So this is the, the proposed wallpapers on your left and then the one that we found is, is on the right. So you can see that it's, you know, it's, it's a match. It's a little crisper because the roller was cleaner, but it's the exact same pattern and color. Okay, and this is, we found when we removed an electrical panel off the wall, you can see a slight change and that's the original wallpaper. And anytime we found that, we just left the wallpaper and re-wallpapered around it. We had uh, a guy that was an expert in finishes and so he came in and he found the original column numbers, which you see in the, below that, and he was able to identify the original paint colors. And so he matched all that and then he restored the original column numbers and then we found the paint. Can you go to the next one? Okay. And the, so this transom had never been painted. And so they were able to match it with his analysis. And you can see that we, we matched the uh, paint and everywhere that needed to be painted, it, it was painted in this original color. Then another interesting thing that happened is um, when they re when they recarpeted, they didn't pull up the pneumatic tube stations, which are, you know, when you go to the drive-in bank, you have those tubes that go to you and the tellers. They didn't pull those up. So they just carpeted around them and we found the original uh, carpet underneath the P-tube stations. So we were able to take that and um, they, <clears throat> we, we found the original and then we looked at it to determine, well, how are we gonna be able to work that? Because it was a woven method, which they don't do anymore. And so they went and worked with Mohawk Carpet, who then added an additional yarn into their process and then they were able to recreate um, the carpet. So you can see that um, the original carpet and then what we recreated. Okay, the viewing room was never changed at all. And so what, what we did is we took out all the seating. It went to um, a lady in Plano, Texas, who she took out, um, the, the left the original upholstery, but she re put in new um, cushions and she cleaned them. She took every piece of gum off of everything. So I have a big wad of gum that we're gonna put on display. And you can see the cleaning before and after. And then over the years, the ashtrays, uh, people had taken the tops as souvenirs and the manufacturer was out of business. And so we were trying to figure out how to remanufacture that. And she had the idea that she just 3D printed them. So we have all 3D printed laser um, 
of tops. So this is just what the, <clears throat> the cushions looked like. They were deteriorating. <clears throat> and then this is the seating. How many of y'all are baseball fans? Anybody? So you know the Houston Astros were named after the astronauts. And so, and um, the Astrodome has this exact same color pattern in it, the orange and red alternating seats. So I'd like to point that out. Then when the, the room was opened up, they built onto the side of the building and they built um, an elevator and stairs. And when they did that, they put in an ADA ramp to the back. And so we had to go in and re-level um, the floor because it wasn't quite right and that the, the, these are original phones uh, that are in the back of the viewing room. So we had to re-level all that and redo, you can see in the, um, in the far right picture of the difference in the floor. So we re-leveled all that and made a new entrance. Excuse me. This is a restored console. Um, we, in order for us to show the visitor experience, which we felt was very um, important for visitors, we didn't want to just show a static room because it doesn't really tell the story or the significance of what they did to land man on the moon. So we took out all of the CRTs, which the, yeah, we took out the CRTs and put in flat screen TVs. Then the, you can go to the next one. Mm -hmm. Then these, Cosmosphere created these place plates for them. And behind that, we, uh, we were able to now display imagery of what the flight controllers were seeing when they were landing on the moon. And then this is when they brought them back. We brought them back on the guppy which is the big, um, we use that to carry cargo and um, pieces of the space station and satellites. And this is all the retired flight controllers. And that was really fun because it was like, you know, kids in a candy store. <clears throat> this is when we put the consoles back in and we um, got them all working and uh, checking the lights and the displays and, and all that. You're talking about the green, the green console. Oh, yeah. So when these first came back, um, remember that when we'd taken them out, they were a hybrid between shuttle and Apollo. And so when they came back, we noticed that these, uh, the green blue lights, those were shuttle colors. So we had to go in and we had to go back through and make sure that there were no green and blue lights on these consoles, or they were blue lights. Um, they did have green lights, but the uh, ones at the top. So we had to go through all of those and, make sure, and change the colors up, make sure they were Apollo. Okay, then the furnishings was a really fun um, part to do because everything that's on a console had to be put there based on, okay, we we'll have to wrap up. So everything was put there based on uh, film imagery and, um, and so she had to go find all this stuff. These are some uh, cuffs and some of the items that are on there. Talk about the ashtrays, the big one. Yeah, the big ashtrays. So they smoke so much that um, the little cigarette ashtrays would fill up too much, and so they complained to the point where they got the big um, amber ashtrays. Okay, and these are the documents that were donated by the flight controllers, and we copied them so that they were on the consoles where they needed to be, and it includes a lot of their uh, personal notes. And these are, you know, chairs and um, just all the different equipment. That and this is a, a cool real quick story. So this is a skill craft chair and we could not find the fabric for the, uh, the, the seating cushion part where the flight controller sat. So we went to the Houston Weavers Guild and a lady took that uh, one by one inch sample and she hand wove all of this, the material for the seats. Okay, and then this is it looking, uh, putting up the medallions. Thank you. Are you finished? Yeah. Okay, and then Adam's going to finish it up. I'll try to go quick here. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the medallions of the room were very important. I've, at the end of a flight, um, the medallions are placed up by a selected uh, flight director of the, of the whichever flight it was. Um, so we had all the Apollo, um, some of the Gemini uh, shuttle, obviously. So we had to have those conversations as to how, how would we deal with that? Because that's, that's a pretty important uh, aspect of the room. Um, but we, we uh, after conversations, we decided to go back with the original look of where the placement of the um, Apollo medallions were and, and put them back. Uh, and the shuttle medallions would stay in the room. We didn't want to remove those from the room and they would go down this hallway, kind of out of sight of the viewing room, but uh, 
visitors on the floor can, can see all of that. Um, we constantly were having to make decisions day to day to day. Uh, I'm sure similar decisions were made when uh, restoring the, uh, the uh, Apollo 11 capsule, um, you know, with regard to use that happened during the national tours and, you know, do you, do you fix that, do you deal with that? You know, we had to deal with similar issues, right? Uh, so during Apollo 11, the names of, of Gemini 9 here weren't, weren't there. Um, after some time, I think between Apollo 14 or 15 or something like that, uh, they added those names because all the rest of the medallions had, had names, so we decided to keep that. Uh, obviously during Apollo 11, this flag wasn't on the wall, but you know, that, was an e that was an easy conversation to, to put that back on the wall. Um, also the Apollo 13 uh, Aquarius wow. mirror, I'm <laughs> getting there. Uh, was put back above the, uh, the water fountain, which we believe to be also very important. That's Jim Lovell uh, visiting the room during the restoration. Uh, really excited to see that um, put in there. Uh, the bat cave was restored as well. We cleaned the floors as best as possible. We, we replaced some of the computer cabinets and things like that, as well as um, Cosmosphere had a couple of the Ida 4 projectors that were used to project the images uh, in this small room off of mirrors and then backlit the, uh, each screen to produce the images that the flight controllers could see. And so there they are in all their glory during testing. You can see Miss Sandra is very happy to see the, the room relit as it formerly was. Um, testing continued, it really matched the original. Um, all of this had to be redrawn by an artist. There were not any of the glass slides remaining to be able to produce these, so we had to go off of videos and photos to, to recreate these. And then mission lighting, uh, from some of the conversations with the flight controllers, we were able to figure out uh, what the lighting should be. There were some hot spots in videos and photos that we could see where, where lighting should be brighter just kind of piecing all that together to, to get the appropriate lighting. And then we uh, were able to get this quiet please sign back working. Access controls, I think we can skip through some of this stuff here. Um, but then the visitor experience, um, he's coming, oh my goodness. Um, we, what's, what's a great display without a great story? Um, obviously there's a, you know, the Apollo 11 landing is, is a great story. So we went through five of the parts of, of the Apollo 11 landing from descent where, you know, and we really felt it was important to not have, you know, video that came back from the moon to put or film, sorry, Stephen would kill me if I said video. Um, but, you know, we really wanted to display what the flight controllers really had to work with. You know, they had math and they had you know, the comms, and that, you know, that was, that was it. There wasn't, you know, they weren't watching real-time film video of, of the landing, so they were, you know, this is the descent, then this is the uh, first steps, uh, Neil Armstrong stepping on the moon for the first time, and this is all exactly how, how it looked at that time. Um, the reading of the plaque that's on the feet of the lunar lander there, um, and then when Nixon called to the moon, we have that as part of the storytelling as well. And then the recovery. So that's, that's uh, the story that's told when you go visit that today. We had Mr. Kranz narrate that, the visitor experience, so that's just kind of an added bonus. Um, we'll get to some of the, yeah, there, you go. there it is, fully restored mission control room. 